Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we pray that you do the work that needs to be done through the power of your spirit and grace. To cause us to think, to feel, to respond, and to act as you would have us to in view of truth. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Romans chapter 9 has a verse, and actually it, it, the verse is representative of a variety of verses in this chapter that speak to a theme that I'd like to talk to you about today, and that theme is sovereign mercy and the incarnation. The incarnation and sovereign mercy. On December the 5th, we thought together about saving mercy. Last week we talked about great mercy giving living hope. Today we talk about sovereign mercy, all of which is given to us in and through the incarnate Christ. The incarnation of God the Son in human flesh is the mercy of God come to us. And we see today this mercy as being a sovereign mercy. I think you'll see it as we go through it. I'd like to walk you through Romans 9, punching a few places along the way to contextualize the point. Paul begins by saying he is passionately concerned for Israel, that is, for Israel to be saved. He says, I have great sorrow, verse 2, great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Verse 3, I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, that is, Physical, biological Israel. He speaks of Israel in a variety of, of ways. Verse 6. He says, they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Which is his way of saying, not all Israelites are true Israelites. He is referring to spiritual Israel, not national Israel. Verse 8, that is, it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Verse 11, he now refers to twin boys. He talks about them here. Jacob and Esau, sons of Rebekah and Isaac. Verse 11, though the twins were not yet born, and had not yet done anything good or bad. That, by the way, informs us that children in the womb do neither good nor bad. All right? So that, verse 11, God's purpose according to his choice would stand. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. For it is written, verse 13, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. God made a choice about these two boys in the womb. Verse 14, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? He knows there will be those who will say, that's not fair. That's not right, he says. May it never be the strongest Greek negative that can be written. That's ludicrous. God cannot be unjust. Verse 15, he says to Moses, Exodus 33, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. 
So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Verse 18, so then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. He just referred to Pharaoh being raised up for the purpose of God's glory in his rebellion and rejection. Verse 19, you will say then to me, why does God still find fault who resists his will? Verse 19 says, verse 21, well, verse 20, let me add that too. Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? That's a good question. Shall the thing molded say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Verse 21, does the potter not have the right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use, another for common use? Yes. Verse 22, what if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. I'm going to stop my reading there and point out if you do not see the thread forgive me you're pretty dense God's redemptive work God's saving work in human history and human lives involves people being saved because God chooses to save them. That is to say, it is not based on what we've done. It's not based on what we promise to do. It's not what we intend to do. It's not based on our morality or our promises in religiosity. It is based on God's sovereign mercy. Now, I'm going to read a bunch of passages here to help make my point because I need to make the point. We begin with a passage I read earlier, 1 Peter. And if you want to follow along, I'll try to give a space of time for you to get there, but we can't stay long. 1 Peter 2, the passage I read earlier, talking about Christians whom he calls earlier in the chapter a living stone or we are living stones being built up into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. Verse 9, he says, you are a chosen race. God chose you. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God chose you to be that. You're a people for God's own possession. God chose you for that purpose. That you would proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You were once were not a people. Now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy. But now you have received mercy. John 15 John 15, gee, the words of, of Jesus. He is preparing the disciples for his death, for his departure. In, ver in chapter 15, beginning in verse 13, he says to them the following. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all these things I have heard from my father. I've made known to you. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. That your fruit would remain. 
So that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. There is this identity, this belonging, this corporate understanding that we are the disciples of Christ, the people of God, because he chose us to be that. When he prays, John 17, just a page or two over, in the, what, what we, I think, should call the high priestly prayer of Christ. Intercession is all through John 17. He is praying diligently to the Father. And you notice beginning in verse 6 and following. How he points out that he's praying for a specific group of people. Whom the Father has chosen. Verse 6. Jesus says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they kept your word. Drop down to verse 9. I ask on their behalf. I, I do not ask on behalf of the world. Now note he's differentiating between the people for whom he's praying and the rest of the world. There's a specific group of people for whom he is praying. I ask on their behalf. Not on behalf of the world. But of those whom you have given me. They are yours. Verse 14. I have given them your word. The world has hated them. Because they're not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. World. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. That's you and that's me. We are included in this group. Let me add to this another passage in John. Chapter 10 of John. Jesus is explaining that he's going to the cross. And on the cross, he's going to lay down his life. But he explains something about his coming and why he has come to do this. Chapter 10, Gospel of John, beginning with verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. There's a particular group of people to whom he is referring. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Verse 15, even as the Father knows me, I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now this explains the main idea that Christ's coming and his saving work in all aspects of his saving work. In his obedience to the law. In his death on the cross. In his rising from the grave. In his ascension back to glory. His intercession in heaven. And his second coming. All of that is for those whom he would save. A specific group of people. We've dealt with this before. Now, I don't want to get into the, the various components of it. But let me simply summarize it to say, Christ in all of his magnificent person and saving work, were it God's will to do so, could have and would have saved the whole world. That's how magnificent he is. But his saving work is applied specifically to his sheep. To his people. The people of God, whom God has chosen. Now, let's expand it a bit before we narrow the scope. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and following. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. That we would be holy and blameless before him. 
In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. One more. Romans chapter 8. Oh, thank goodness, pastor's finally getting to a good passage I can relate to. Well, hold your horses. Romans 8, beginning verse 28. We know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he, the son, would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he called. These he called, he justified. And these he justified, he also glorified. The whole chain of redemption from eternity past where God's people are elect and foreknown and predestined goes through human history through the sovereign work of God in the saving work of Christ whereby he was born, he lived righteously, he went to the cross, died, rose again for those whom God hath chosen before the foundation of the world. These are the ones about whom Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. One day every child of God, whom God chose from the foundation of the earth, will be in glory with him. And we will form the family of God to his praise and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, why in heaven's name would I preach this in December? That's a good question. And I have two answers. This is the application. Number one. This explains a lot. Explains a lot. It explains basically two things. It explains why people reject Christ. And it explains why people accept Christ. Christ. You thought, if you're a saved person, you thought you could take some credit. Oh, but I got news for you. It's much bigger than you. You are, in the words of Romans 9, a vessel of mercy. But before I get to that, this explains why the preacher. <laughs> it's not funny, but you have to laugh without, you know, my, my mom always said it's better to laugh than cry. Sunday after Sunday, month after month, year after year, the preacher pours his heart over the text of Scripture, crying out to God on Monday, God, speak to me. What do I tell them? They're going to show up Sunday and expect to hear from you. Oh, God, help me. I'm not good enough for this. You've got to open the text to my heart and set me aflame for their sake. And you come prayerfully, burdened to the pulpit. Sunday after Sunday, month after month, year after year, and pour out your heart. And for decades, people sit there and never get it. Wonder when he'll get done. 
Well, let's see, what are we doing? Boy, it sure is pretty out today. And the God of greatness is present. And the word of God is proclaimed. There will be Baptists in hell. There are Baptists in hell today. Members of Baptist churches and Christian churches and Nazarene churches. There are preachers in hell. I didn't say creatures, I said preachers. There are deacons in hell. There are elders in hell. Because the human heart is so stubborn, it is so hard, it is so obstinate, that unless God in His sovereign mercy breaks through, there will never be a response to the truth. Jesus tells a parable. Do you not remember? The sower goes out to sow. The seed... Flies in every direction. And some of the seed falls on hard ground. And it just lays there. It doesn't find penetration. It doesn't find root. And the devil comes and swoops in and takes the seed away. Sitting in church looking at this stupid device instead of listening to the word of God playing with the kids instead of listening to the word of God thinking about the football game instead of listening to the word of God the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked it takes the greatness and power and mercy and the spirit of God to break through and unless he does But he does. But he does. This explains why some of us are saved. Oh, I want to tell you. I remember growing up in the church. And I don't mind saying I was a pretty good boy. I could tell you about my Sunday school class and my lessons in those days, you had to fill in the blanks. Some of you remember those. And you'd get, and you'd get Sunday school, what did what, what they call that? Not medals, but pins, Sunday school pins. <laughs> oh, yeah. And yet at night, when a preacher was preaching, and he was doing a fairly poor job of it, God said, tonight's the night. I became aware that I was a vessel of mercy. God poured out his mercy. That he opened my heart to the glorious truths of Christ, which I had known for years. But I never had seen them in such beauty and wonder and glory. Why did that happen? Because the Spirit came. Why did the Spirit come? Because Christ was interceding for me. Why did Christ intercede? Because he had died for me. Why did he die for me? Because he was born for me. Why was he born for me? Because the Father chose me from the foundation of the world. It goes together from beginning to end. Why people don't come and why they do. But there's one other answer to the question, why am I preaching on this at Christmas? Because brothers and sisters in Christ... I think this is our comfort. I want to talk about the comfort. And I want to give several things in how this truth comforts you. Then we're going to Bethlehem. As we close. How does knowing that God chose you in mercy comfort you? Let me list a number of ways. Number one. It exalts God in your life. And by the way, that's a good thing. Anything, any, anybody who, who elevates man brings God lower. And that's bad, right? 
If you're, if you're just into what we can do, you probably don't pray. What you do is you plan. There are a lot of planning instead of praying going on. You know why? Because we believe we can do it. But if we pray, we pray because we know God must do it. Or it ain't going to get done. You can build the altar, but the fire falls from heaven. It exalts God. To glorify God. And, and, and we know this every Sunday. We come here for the same reason. We don't change. To glorify God and talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. It exalts Him. It gives Him the praise. It gives Him the credit. It gets Him the glory. And not to us. Number two. It comforts because it inspires thankfulness in us. If, if, you don't, if you don't know God has chosen you, it'll be difficult for you to be thankful. But if you know God in His sovereign mercy has chosen you, you're going to be grateful for that. Woo, Lord, I don't know why you did that. You know, some people walk around going, I know why I did it because I'm so wonderful. Please, give me a break. I don't, I'm getting honest today. I'm, I need to be careful. You're not that great. And I'm not that great. Your children aren't that great. But many of us are vessels of his mercy. And that is great. He poured out his mercy upon us. His grace upon us. Not because of who we are. What we are. Or what we aim to be. But because of his mercy. By the way, there's a verse for that. Titus 3.5. I highly recommend you memorize it. That inspires thankfulness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone who thinks they've achieved their own salvation, don't thank God. They thank themselves. They praise themselves. Third, it births hope. It births hope. If God chose me from the foundation of the world and my sins are paid for in full on the cross, and Jesus is my Lord of life, my high priest making intercession for us, my, my deliverer in his second coming, having prepared a place for me in heaven, then I have all the hope in the world. I am secure. I am assured. I am safe. Because I'm God's. I'm God's by his choosing. This world is losing hope rapidly. The church must show the world hope. Hope in the saving work of God in Christ. And let me add one more. We could add a bunch. And this one a lot of people miss. This truth of the Sovereign mercy of God. In my salvation. Motivates me to serve him more. I, if I've heard this once. I've heard it 150 times. You can't preach that. That destroys evangelism. M mission work will stop. If you tell people. That, that God has an elect people. All over the world. And that he has chosen them. Then, then we won't preach the gospel. Brothers and sisters, that's why we preach the gospel. Because God has a people in the world. When you go into a city, you go, God has some people here. I'm going to preach. I'm going to pray. I'm going to witness. God has some people here. They may not know it yet. But God's going to get them. God's going to get them. It gives you confidence. It gives you inspiration. It'll hold you settled while you preach. Sunday after Sunday. Month after month. Year after year. And see no response. God's working. He, because he cannot not work. He's got a people. He's got a people. It'll hold you steady. Make you steadfast. And bind your heart. To your mission. Knowing that there will be those in heaven. In whom you had a part. Because God sent you to get his people. 
I believe no parable explains this any better than the one Jesus told in Luke 15 about the lost sheep. The shepherd leaves the 90 and 9 and he goes after that lost sheep. Come with me, friend. Come on. Let's go to the manger again, shall we? Let's go to that little stable. <laughs> Smell the straw. Look over there. There are humble shepherds kneeling. Looks like they've seen angels. Mary and Joseph close by. Overwhelmed by the night. And there he is. In that manger. That little bitty fella. The son of God. In human flesh. Why? Because he, he's in that manger for you. And every day of his life, he picks up the mantle of obedience to the law of God for you. It's your righteousness he's earning. And when he goes to the cross, he goes there for you. And when he went back to heaven, he went there for you. Yes, the whole world could have been saved. But he is doing all that for you and for me. Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your saving mercy. For your great mercy. And for your sovereign mercy. Thank you that this story of redemption, the Christmas story, is a story of your saving mercy. Lord, in these days, the world is untethered from its mooring and is unraveling at the seams. Begin. Continue your work through the life of your church and begin with your praise in your sovereign mercy in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.